Uh, so what we're going to talk right now is about uh, understanding and addressing the unique needs of women and girls in the criminal justice system. Our speaker is Lisa Broidy. She is a Distinguished Regents Professor and Chair of Sociology and Criminology at the University of New Mexico. She also holds an appointment as an adjunct at the Griffin, Griffith Criminology Institute in Brisbane, Australia. She focuses on the ways in which gender, life course transitions, institutional contact, um, victimization, and other emotional influences affect affect people, particularly women and girls. My name is Lisa Forty, as Chris said, and I have been studying women and girls as victims and as uh, individuals caught up in the criminal justice system. I'm reluctant to call them offenders, um, but that is typically what we call them. Um, hopefully by the end of my talk, you'll question whether we should call them offenders as well. Um, and you'll also question whether the criminal justice system is really the best place for the vast majority of them. Um, I recognize that you guys have had a full morning already. You've had two great speakers. I have, like, Rick and Charles are two of my favorite people, so those are hard acts to follow. Um, and you're either eating lunch or in your post-lunch lull. So I will do my best to keep you engaged. Um, and as one strategy for doing that, feel free to interrupt me if something I say doesn't make sense, if you have questions. Um, I am totally comfortable engaging in Q&A during my talk, um, and for sure uh, we'll have time to do that after as well. Um, I'm probably going to rush a little bit, but if I'm going too fast, um, please just raise your hand or ask me to slow down a little bit. I tend to talk quickly. Um, all right, so I'm going to just jump right in because I know our time is short. And um, the first thing I want to do is just a teeny bit of framing, and that is around the question of why should we care about women and girls in the system. So I did a little bit of journalistic sleuthing um, when I was deciding what to talk about here today because I was kind of weighing whether I wanted to talk about women and girls as victims or women and girls as individuals caught up in the system. Now those are significantly overlapping populations, as you'll see. Um, and I have done a lot of research on, on both of those things and on the overlap um, between those things. Uh, but I decided to focus on the justice involved angle because um, from the little bit of, of kind of research that I did looking at what's out there in the journalistic space, um, there is very little out there in the journalistic space about women and girls uh, who are in the system. And what is out there um, for the most part is kind of talking about women as violent offenders, which is about this many of them. Um, and, and then there's some about the kind of lack of resources and, and problems and the inflation of the number of women and girls in the system and those kinds of things. Um, but I want to talk through that a little more and just give you some background if this is something that's interesting to you to explore more fully in a journalistic context. Um, I hope to give you enough background to do that um, carefully and honestly. So the first question is, why should we care? Um, in one sense, the reason why, if you do a quick look, it looks like we don't care is because, relatively speaking, there are not a lot of women and girls in the system, right? They make up about 50 to 20% of, of the system-involved population, and that's if we talk about the system as a whole, including probation and parole and community sentences. Um, if we're talking about the incarcerated population, it's more like 10%. Right, so the question of why should we care is, or why we haven't traditionally cared is because they're a small group. Um, that said, the proportion of system-involved women is rising, rising much faster than the proportion of system-involved men, although it's a proportion, so if one's going up, one has to be going down, right? Um, and the reasons why I think this is important and why I hope to convince you is in, that it's important is because, yes, there are obvious economic costs. We all know it's expensive to keep people incarcerated. It's expensive to have them it, with any system involvement, right? That's your tax dollars at work, and it's a lot of tax dollars. Um, but I think the thing that gets lost and that we forget about often are the hidden costs. Um, or what we call collateral consequences of incarceration. And one thing I would argue is that those are particularly notable for women and girls, right? So um, we can talk about the cost to well-being for women and girls. This is not to discount the cost to well-being for men and boys. Um, 
but there are arguments to be made that the cost to women and girls' well-being from system involvement is more dramatic. The cost to children and families, because women tend to be the primary caretakers um, in, uh, of children and the kind of glue that holds families together, so those costs, those collateral consequences are exaggerated when we're um, putting women in the system. And um, the cost to communities, I would say, are also amplified when we're incarcerating women and girls. The other reason why um, I think it's important to think about costs is because most women and girls are incarcerated for nonviolent offenses, right? And um, the costs and consequences from where I stand, and hopefully again at the end of this talk from where you stand, arguably outweigh the benefits of system involvement. So that's just by way of kind of background and my own thinking about these things, and certainly your thinking may differ. Um, but let me talk you through it a little bit. So when we talk about the criminal justice system and the juvenile justice system, what we're talking about are systems that were built around the behaviors and needs of men and boys. These are not systems that were developed with women and girls in mind. This matters because compared to women and girls, men and boys are substantially different and their offending is substantially different. They offend for very different reasons and I'll talk you through some of those. They offend significantly more often. Their recidivism rate is significantly higher and their offending is by pretty much any metric more serious, including more violent, right? And so when we talk about women and girls, when we're putting them in a system that's designed to address violent offending, recurrent offending, um, offending for reasons that differ substantially from those that, women get, that get women and girls caught up in the system, my argument would be that a system designed to address the behaviors and needs of men and boys is probably not all that well suited to addressing the behaviors and needs of women and girls. So that's where we start. So to effectively address the needs of women and girls, I would argue there are five things I would like to um, help walk you through so that you can understand them. The first is gender differences in the causes of offending. Men and women, like I said, offend for different reasons. Um, and so I want to talk you through that briefly. Um, the trends, the offending and incarceration trends and how they vary, I think it's important to understand those. So I'm gonna talk you through those a little bit. Um, I'm gonna talk you through the broad risks and needs that women and girls who present to the system come in with. Um, and then I also want to talk about, um, lest I leave you with the idea that this is one homogeneous population, um, that women and girls among themselves enter the system for different reasons and there is variation within this population. So I wanna talk you through some of that. And then I'm gonna end by talking about promising strategies for intervention and prevention. Um, and just a kind of teaser, there aren't a lot of them. And that's a shame. Um, okay, so when we talk about why women and girls offend, uh, there are kind of two theoretical frameworks that scholars use when they're trying to think this through and two questions that they try to address. One question is, how do we explain the gender gap? Men and women <laughs> offend at different rates um, and they offend in different ways and how do we explain those differences? And the second question is, when women offend, why do they offend, right? Those are the two key questions that um, scholars in this area are looking at. And there are two frameworks for thinking about that. One is this kind of gender neutral framework. We have a whole history of criminological theory that yes, admittedly, was developed to explain the behavior of boys and men, um, but why would we think it wouldn't apply to girls and women? Well, I have some ideas about that, but um, since we're short on time, I'm not gonna bore you with them. Um, but there is an argument to be made that while criminological theories have traditionally been male specific, they could still in some ways apply to the behavior of women and they could help us understand gender differences in offending. Um, and so my argument is, are these theories potentially gender neutral? Yes and no. Um, and so what I would argue is that similar theoretical mechanisms or causes, if you will, 
can play out in very different ways across men and women, boys and girls. And so my own work has spent a lot of time examining a theoretical framework called general strain theory. It's a pretty simple theory, um, and the basics are up there for you. The argument is that every day, all of us encounter various strains. Just trying to get back here by 110, knowing that you want to get lunch and be back here in time, right? That's kind of stressful. And what happens? You have all these emotions that start floating around like, crap, should I skip lunch? What should I do, right? And, and you start to like think, oh, I don't know what to do, right? It feels bad. Um, and so you figure out some kind of coping strategy. You resign to the fact that you're gonna be late and you take a deep breath and you say, okay, I'm okay with it, right? That's a legitimate coping strategy. You skip lunch, you run here, you get here just in time and you realize everyone else is late and damn, you wish you got that lunch, right? Um, those are all coping strategies. The reality is, depending on the type of strain and how much of it you have and how often you experience it um, and the kinds of negative emotions that those strains engender, so anger in particular is a really problematic emotion, um, our coping strategies are better or worse, right? Depending on what we're dealing with. Um, and so the argument when we're looking at gender differences here is um, that this dynamic, that when legitimate coping strategies don't work, we tend to turn to illegitimate ones, um, that that's true for males and females. What's not true is that, or what's different, I should say, is the kinds of strains that are salient, that matter to men versus women or boys versus girls, um, and the kinds of emotions that they experience. So um, some of my work and other people's work suggests that when men experience anger, they're super comfortable with it and they're super comfortable acting on it. When women experience anger, we experience all kinds of other emotions too. We feel shame, we feel guilt, we feel all these other things that we've been taught to feel, right, around anger, right? It's a much more complicated emotion for us. And that means we cope with it differently. There's a lot of work to suggest that anger triggers illegitimate and particularly criminal offending for boys. Um, but for girls, because anger is concomitant with all kinds of other emotions, it's not as likely to trigger at least violent types of responses, right? Where you might instead turn to alcohol or drugs or other kinds of um, self-harm types of coping strategies. Um, so that's the way we think about um, kind of quote unquote gender neutral theories. Well, they might be gender neutral, but they probably play out substantially different for um, men and women, boys and girls. Um, and mostly that can help us understand the gender gap in offending. That's why this dynamic and the differences in strain and negative emotions and coping resources and coping styles, that's why men offend more than women from the perspective of general strain theory. And there's good data to support that. The other way that we think about understanding gender differences in offending, and particularly female offending, is by developing female-specific explanations, Excl explanations that start with females at their center, right? Um, and the most well-known one of these is what we call feminist pathways theory. And feminist pathways theory starts from the experiences of women and girls who offend. And sadly, those experiences, by and large, are rooted in early trauma, right? So um, almost all women and girls in the system have experienced some kind of early trauma, oftentimes multiple early traumas, um, in the form of sexual abuse, physical and emotional abuse, and others that I'll show you in a little bit. And the argument from feminist pathways theory is that those early experiences lead to all kinds of mental health problems. That's that internal latent. Those are the internal mental health dynamics that are triggered from early trauma. Um, and the more of that that you experience and the worst mental health kinds of consequences that you experience, the younger you're gonna start acting out. A lot of that looks like running away. When girls run away, they have to support themselves, right? Um, there are all kinds of ways they can support themselves. Most of them get them in trouble with the law. We call those survival crimes. Prostitution, theft, drugs, drug sales, um, those kinds of things. Um, and some of that gets them involved in violence, often in the course of self-defense. Um, and others of it get them involved in property offenses. 
And so these kinds of um, dynamics are uh, developed to explain specifically what it is in the pathways of system-involved women that explains how they got there, right? And so those are the two ways we think about female offending um, and how to understand gender differences and how to understand why women offend when they offend. So I think those are important. The second thing that I think is important to understand is where we are. What do the numbers look like, right? Um, and so I'm going to show you some numbers around juveniles and then I'm going to show you some numbers around adults in the system. So one thing I said at the beginning is that the gender gap in incarceration is narrowing. Now one of the things that you sometimes see in um, newspapers and other um, journalistic outlets is an engagement with that fact that the gender gap is narrowing but limited interrogation of that fact, right? And so without interrogating that fact, we might think, well, that's because female offending is going up. The reality is, if you look at these charts, it's not because female offending is going up, right? It's because male offending is going down a lot faster. That's why the gap is narrowing, right? Men and women, well, girls and boys in this case, arrests are going down for both. But male arrests started much higher, had much further to fall, um, and so what happens when their trends are actually very similar but males are starting higher is that this proportion um, that females make up, I guess you could use the pointer, um, this proportion right here uh, starts to go up, right? Because men's is falling faster, the gap is narrowing. Does that make sense? Um, so the key takeaway is that, yes, the gender gap is narrowing, but it's narrowing because arrest for boys is going down more quickly than arrest for girls. They're both going down. That's, that's a good thing, right? The other thing that I think it's important to recognize is that these statistics are not uniform, right? And so we know very well from all kinds of things that are happening in, and have been happening for decades um, that when it comes to men and boys, race, ethnicity matters. When it comes to women and girls, race, ethnicity matters there too, right? Um, black girls are 2.7 times more likely than white girls to be referred to juvenile justice. They're 1.2 times more likely to be detained. Right? There's overrepresentation um, among black girls in the system. They're three times more likely to be removed from their homes and placed in state custody than white girls. And prosecutors are 20% more likely to formally petition cases involving black girls than cases involving white girls. Um, so uh, you can make the same message around men and boys. Um, race matters. And it matters in important and um, frustrating ways. So, a couple of takeaway points from the data on juveniles. Uh, girls arrests are falling slower than boys. We saw that. Um, one of the questions that we wrestle with is why. Um, and there are two key arguments floating around out there that I think are um, important and that have a fair bit of data behind them. One is that part of the reason why girls' numbers are falling more slowly than boys is because of net widening policies that have particularly affected girls. Net widening policies are policies where things that we might not otherwise have, um, or, or behaviors that we might not have otherwise used the system to deal with, get captured into the system, right? Our net, our system net is getting bigger, right? And capturing more behaviors that we would otherwise have ignored. Um, and so one of the key ways this is happening is police intervention in schools. It is now completely common to have school resource officers in uniform with guns in our schools, right? And what that means is that when kids engage in behaviors, when they push each other on the playground, they don't have the teacher or the principal coming in, they have the cops, right? And that widens the net. That gets them caught up in the system in a way that did not used to happen, right? And that particularly is common for girls. Another thing that we see with girls is changes in family management strategies. Parents get frustrated, and instead of like taking a time out, they actually call the cops and ask them to come take her away, right? More and more, um, we're seeing more of this than was the case in the past. And we're seeing um, more uh, kind of, um, tolerance of the police for helping deal with these things. 
um, and we're seeing less tolerance towards early female misbehavior. So part of this net widening is related to a philosophy of preventative punishment, right? If we get at it early, then deterrence will work, right? We'll scare them, we'll scare them straight, and all is good. The data does not support that, right? That philosophy of preventative punishment is really a philosophy of long-term system involvement, right? Once they're in, things change in dramatic ways, um, and in dramatic ways that spiral out of control. So that's the juvenile story. Let me talk you through the adult story really quickly. Um, the adult story looks very similar. Um, broadly, what this picture of 2018 arrests should show you is that for almost any type of crime, the dark blue, darker blue line is significantly higher than the lighter blue line. Men are significantly more likely to engage in almost any offense that we track than women. There are a few unsurprising, um, you know, kind of counters to that. Uh, one is prostitution, right? Who gets arrested for that? We already knew that one. Um, the other is embezzlement. And, and here, what the um, numbers tend to hide or, or what our maybe frame mind, mindset around embezzlement tends to hide is that embezzlement is actually a pretty petty offense. That's stealing money from the cash register at work, right? Um, and so uh, the, this is another one of those survival crimes that um, you commonly see women engage in to be able to bring home enough money to feed their families. When we talk about changes um, in male and female arrests, this is 2009 to 2018. Uh, this line right here, that's the zero line. So everything on this side is a reduction. Everything on this side is an increase between 20, 2009 and 2018. So a couple things that seem obvious from these numbers. One, arrests are going down for males and females. But as we saw with juveniles, they're going down faster for males. Um, there are increases in female arrests for a few notable offenses. Um, vagrancy, okay, that's related to survival crimes, homelessness, drugs, uh, drug abuse violations. The war on drugs um, has been a driver of increases in women's incarceration. Weapons violations, we could argue that that's part of the survival dynamic. Motor vehicle theft, I'm not sure what to do with, but that's going up for males and females. And, I need to look into why. Um, so I'm going to leave that one. And then um, murder and non-negligent manslaughter, that's one that um, it's hard to really parse because the numbers for women are so small that any change can shift the numbers pretty dramatically. Um, so I would argue that that's one that you don't want to make too much of because we're starting with really small ends. Um, what I would say this picture should um, leave you with and what I will show you in the next few slides um, is that the war on drugs has been extremely consequential for women. So um, you can see here starting in um, the 70s and 80s before the war on drugs and mass incarceration in the United States um, that the numbers were fairly low. Um, and then when you look at, this is growth rate. So this is not saying there are more women in prison than men. This is saying the growth in the numbers of women incarcerated is substantially quicker and the rise is substantially uh, more dramatic than has been the case for men. That, people, is the war on drugs again. This is saying that the increase, remember, um, so this is just the increase, it's not numbers. It's the, the increase, the rate of increase. So the, these, if we put numbers on this, this would go way down here compared to men, right? But the rate of increase in the numbers of women getting caught up in the system is dramatically faster than the rate of increase, increase for men. Part of it is that if we put numbers on here, like we saw before, men are starting higher. So the, the changes in raw numbers are going to be less dramatic in percentage form, right, in terms of rate of increase. Um, but yes, the, the increases have been much more dramatic for women in response to the war on drugs. Um, and then you can see that this is women specific, the rise in incarceration from 1980 to 2019. Um, and again, I would argue that this reflects changes in practice and policy. This is not dramatic changes in women's behavior, right? Um, this is dramatic changes in our penal philosophy. 
right? And again, um, people have argued that the war on drugs has fundamentally been a war on women, um, and this is the outcome of that. Um, and so as a last kind of effort to convince you of that, this is a similar slide to the one we saw focusing only on drug arrests. Um, from 1985, early in the war on drugs, to 2019, um, women's drug arrests have gone up 216%. Men's have only gone up 48%. So when we're talking about adults, uh, the other thing that I think it's important to recognize, again, is that race matters. Compared to white women, minority women are significantly more likely to get caught up in the criminal justice system for drug offenses. So we could argue that the war on drugs is not just a war on women, but a war on minority women, and probably most dramatically, a war on black women. Uh, black women are twice as likely to be incarcerated for drug offenses. Latinas, 20% more likely. And Native Americans, though they're a very small percentage of the population, six times more likely than white women to be incarcerated for drug offenses. Um, and I will say that there's a lot of good evidence on this, and um, it suggests that this is not a function of drug use trends across different um, population groups, but rather racialized criminalization processes, right? The system um, is much more comfortable and much more targeted towards incarcerating minority women than white women. Um, and that's a function of over-policing in certain neighborhoods. It's a function of um, all kinds of dynamics that trap women in the system and the precursors to that. Um, the other thing I would say is that black women are no more likely than white women to use drugs while they're pregnant, but far more likely to re be reported to child welfare services for drug use. Um, so again, this is um, reflected in some of those statistics because when they're reported to the child welfare services, a lot of times child endangerment and child abuse laws come into play. So the last thing I'll leave you with is something that we know about men, um, and that is we incarcerate more men than any other civilized country um, or developed country. Um, I don't want you to think that is not also the case for men, for women, because unfortunately it is. I put Illinois up here. Um, you can actually go to this site and look at other, put other states in context too. Um, but you can see the dramatic numbers. Um, we incarcerate substantially more women than any other developed country. Um, so again, I leave you with the question of, is that sensible, right? Um, so let's talk about, if we're going to incarcerate all these women, we probably need to think about what we do for them, or um, what we should do for them, I guess I should say. Um, and so when we talk about risks and needs of females in the system, there is general overlap for males and females in the risks and needs, but there are also some really important and substantial differences, both in exposure, which means how much of these risks women are exposed to relative to men, um, and salience, how much they matter, right? The impact that these things have. Um, those are the two places where the same risks might matter differently, right? That women see more of certain risks than men and that they impact them more substantially um, than boys and men. So a couple of the places where we see that most acutely is that girls in the system, more so than boys, come from dysfunctional family contexts, and there are all kinds of ways that we could define that, um, and they have substantially more mental health needs. Um, so here's some numbers to put that into context. Girls in the juvenile justice system, 31% um, of them have some form of or some history of sexually abuse, sexual abuse compared to 7% of boys. Um, and then they have 45% of girls in the system have been exposed to five or more ACEs. ACEs are adverse childhood experiences. The next slide will show you um, a little bit more about that. Boys in the system experience ACEs too, right? Um, but they don't experience them as dramatically and as clustered as girls. Um, and so that's what that's suggesting. And then at the bottom, mental health diagnoses among justice-involved youth. 
Um, this is troubling on both counts, right? 67% of boys and 80% of girls. I, I, I don't even think it's worth parsing the difference, right? We need mental health services for these youth, whether they're boys or girls. So here's a chart talking more um, explicitly about adverse childhood experiences by gender. Um, and you can see, like I said, boys and girls both um, experience all of these things. Family violence is huge in the backgrounds of boys and girls in the system. Um, parental separation or divorce, right? Those are dramatic for young people. Um, incarceration of a household member, that's that intergenerational cycle of system involvement that we see. Um, and so you can see the different kinds of ACEs that they are commonly exposed to. Again, what's different for boys and girls, they, they both experiencing, experience these, but girls are more likely to experience five or more of these girls in the system. That's a lot of need, right? Those are really important things to address. Um, and so, so that's one of, the, one of the differences that is important to keep in mind. Um, and so what that tells us and um, what a lot of literature looking at this tells us is that the problem behavior of girls and young women more so than boys and, and, and young men is linked to these kinds of things. First, disrupted interpersonal networks. So when I started talking about salience and exposure, um, interpersonal networks have substantially more salience for girls than boys. They care about emotional bonds and emotional relationships in ways that boys don't. Um, and so when those things are fractured, um, that tends to have a more dramatic effect on girls than it does on boys. This is not to say that these things don't matter for boys and men, but that they matter differently, and a lot of literature suggests they matter more for girls and women. Um, trauma and abuse. Girls in the system are, um, have exposure to domestic violence, child abuse, partner violence, um, in greater number than boys and men. Um, this is, it's almost uh, universal for girls and women in the system. Uh, mental health needs also almost universal for girls and women in the system. PTSD, not surprisingly, right? It's linked to this, right? And then along with PTSD, we see a lot of anxiety, we see a lot of depression, we see a lot of self-medication, right? Substance use and substance abuse as um, part of that cycle. Uh, and then the other thing that we see among girls and women in the system is that the moments when they get caught up in the system tend to be around developmental transitions, right? Navigating the transition to adolescence, super complicated. Complicated for boys, complicated for girls. Um, that's when they get in trouble. Navigating the transition to adulthood. So emerging adulthood, there's a lot of new literature around that time between about 18 and 26 um, that's become much more amorphous. Um, adolescence, people argue, has been extended. Um, but that period is different because our expectations on people are different. So um, developmental psychologists have taken to calling it emerging adulthood. And a lot of people struggle in that period, um, girls and women in particular. The other thing that um, is particularly uh, unique for girls and women in the system is experiences of motherhood. Okay, yes, men have experiences of fatherhood and parenthood, um, but motherhood is particularly unique, um, and it's unique in a number of ways. The majority of incarcerated women are mothers, and a large fraction of incarcerated juveniles are mothers. Um, and they are more often than not the primary caregiver for that child. That is not the case when men go to prison or jail. Um, more often than not, mom's still home with the kids, right? And so that dynamic of women being taken away from their kids is much more um, difficult to navigate than is the case when fathers are taken away from their kids. And so there are a lot of risks and needs linked to the motherhood status of incarcerated women and girls. 
Uh, and this is one thing that um, I've been focusing on in my research lately, both in Australia and in the States. Um, in Australia, we have a project where we're interviewing mothers on the inside and caregivers and children on the outside and looking at, at how maternal incarceration affects the well-being of children um, and of the moms on the inside. Here, more recently, I've done some interviews with mothers in jail, which is where most women end up. And they end up there cyclically, right, for short sentences anywhere from a few weeks to a year. Um, and they tend to come back repeatedly, often for the same crime on warrants, right? They get out, they don't pay a fine, they come back. They get out, they don't show up for a hearing, they go back, right? It's all for the first charge, right? They could go back six times on one drug charge, right? And every time they go back, something has to happen with their kids, right? Who's taking care of them? Um, and that has significant effects, not just on their kids, but on them and their maternal identities and their mental health around that, right? Um, and so one of the things that I've found in talking to these women about motherhood and how they feel about being incarcerated moms um, is that they really, really, really want to be good mothers and they really, really, really feel like the resources to be that mom that they wanna be are wholly inadequate, right? Um, and most of them that I talked to had lost their kids well before they started cycling in and out of jail. They lost them to homelessness, they lost them to drugs, they lost them to alcohol, they lost them to mental health, right? And so they actively gave them to a family member, said, uncle, I can't do it, it's not good for my child. Um, or a family member came and took them away, you can't do this, it's not good for your child. Or the state came in and took them. Right, and so the dynamics of kind of dealing with that kind of loss to a key identity for women are dramatic. Um, and most of them told me that they can't envision being a good mom again until they figure out their housing needs, until they figure out how to get clean, until they figure out how to get a job, until they lose the stigma from their parents and siblings and everyone else um, that reminds them constantly that they can't do this, right? Um, that there's a lot that needs to change before they feel like they can be good moms again. And they don't feel like the jail is providing those resources. So um, one thing I said at the beginning, and um, I don't think that's been clear in the discussion so far, is that women in the system are not a homogeneous group. Um, we know that there are demographic differences, race plays a big factor there, um, but there are also differences in the way in which they engage the system. And so a lot of times we like to talk about various kinds of offenders. We can talk about this small group at the top, that chronic persistent offender. Um, some of those are women, very few of them actually. We can talk about adolescent or young adult onset, that turbulent period in adolescence that people get caught up in the system. And we can talk about people who, you know, just kind of one and done, right? Um, and we see that among women. So let me talk you through each of these. I'm gonna start with the chronic persistent offenders. These are the ones that we worry the most about. These are the ones that get entrenched in the system, right? Because we don't do very, very well help at helping them. So these are the ones that get caught up in the system early. These are the ones who are exposed to trauma at a very young age, the ones that have the multiple ACEs. Um, a lot of them are dually involved, so if you look at youth in the juvenile justice system, a fifth to a quarter are girls. If you look at du dually involved youth, those who are in the family services system and the juvenile justice system, that number bumps to a third to a half being girls, right? So um, early family abuse, early family violence, those kinds of things um, that get women involved in the system. For this population, Early intervention is huge, right? And not early in the intervention in the form of let's throw them in jail and let them sort it out or into the juvenile justice system, but I mean real, um, real intervention, trauma-informed treatment for their mental health and substance problems, helping them build emotional resilience, helping them build coping skills and relationship skills, um, and the kinds of things that they're going to need to transition out of this cycle, right? Um, and, and this is a common way in which this cycle is of um, that chronic persistent female offender is depicted. 
Um, and so the argument is that the way in which this entrenchment happens is because their early reactions to trauma, especially um, family trauma, are criminalized, right? They run away from home, they get trapped in the system. Um, they get out of the system, they're back on the street, they're prostituting, they get caught up in the system again. They get out, they're you know, using drugs to cope, they're still prostituting, they're, um, and the cycle just gets worse and worse and their symptoms get exacerbated. Because every time they get in the system, they are also at risk for various kinds of trauma-inducing experiences, and every time they're on the street, they're at risk for more trauma-inducing experiences. So everything gets multiplied. This is a really high-needs group, right, that we um, have not done a very good job with. Um, the next group that we tend to see is the adolescent onset group. This is actually a group that we do better with, um, so this is the group that oftentimes they experience early puberty, some precocious sexuality, they're exploring the transition to adolescence, um, they start to fight with their parents, right, I want more freedom, you treat me like I'm a kid. Um, and so they have this kind of maturity gap, an identity crisis, and they act out, right? And that's totally normal, like who didn't, right? That's being a teenager. Where this gets problematic is when that acting out gets them into some kind of trouble that becomes a snare, right? That they don't know how to deal with and don't deal with effectively. effectively. So teen pregnancy, that can happen when they're acting out and trying to be more adult than they think they are or their parents think they are. Abusive relationships, right? Teen dating violence, um, that can be a snare that can trap them in a problematic cycle. Educational disengagement. Once they disengage from the educational system, um, we tend to see more involvement in alcohol and drugs and more problematic behavior. And those snares are the things that get them caught up in the system when they're trying to navigate adolescence. And so that's, those are the things that we want to help them navigate, right? So that, that doesn't lead them to system involvement, right? So these are um, girls who need family therapy right? Typically, their families are there for them. They just don't know how to deal with them, right? Adolescents are difficult. Um, my sister has two right now, and I don't envy her at all. Um, they're developing autonomy and independence, and they need help, right? They need some guidance. They need some structure. They need some rules. Um, when they mess up, they need help figuring out how to fix it. Um, and so that shifting parent-child relationship, um, again, more support for parents, more support for girls. Um, and then the last one is that young adult onset, right? And, and we talked about this or alluded to this a little bit too. Um, these are people 18 to 25 navigating that transition out of adolescence. All of a sudden, there's all these demands on them. Mom and dad have kicked them out. You know, find your own place to stay. You're 18. And they're just not ready, right? They're not equipped. Um, and so they need help with job skills and relationship skills and emotional management and coping. Um, and if they don't get that, then their lives can quickly spiral, right? Alcohol and drugs are an easy fix, self-medication, um, getting involved in bad relationships, those kinds of things. Um, the young adult onset and the adolescent onset, again, those are oftentimes when they get intervention, they're very responsive, right? It's the early starters, that chronic group with all the trauma that they bring with them, those are the ones that caught up in the system and that need the most help and that we are the least equipped to help. Um, so let me just kind of wrap it up. Uh, intervention and prevention, we're not doing a good job. We don't really know what works and how to help these girls. Um, it's not a priority for a system with limited resources and still limited numbers of girls, right? Um, and so the research and evidence base for what works with females is growing, but most programs are localized, they're small scale, they're privately funded, and they're understudied. Um, so we don't know a lot here. Uh, I just pulled this from uh, uh, Illinois website, um, and I pulled it just because we're in Illinois, but. I could probably find this on any state, really. Um, and basically it's saying in Illinois, we have very few programs for at-risk girls. Um, this was from about 10 years ago and it was the best one I could find. And they talk about this girls link, which is uh, OJJDP national model program. I can't find ev any evidence that it still exists. 
Um, and then there's this statement here that beyond a few programs for system involved girls in Illinois, um, there are a number of small scale programs, but not very many, right? That's the picture nationwide. This was 10 years ago. It is still the picture today. Um, and so there are a couple of things that we need to be thinking about. Um, and I think first and foremost is the fact that most girls in the system are very high needs and very low risk. And so the question is, what do we do for them if we're going to put them in the system? And the real question is, is system contact and incarceration really the best option for them? Hi, I'm Maya Hi. King with Politico. Thanks for doing this. Um, wanted to know if you had any data on uh, trans women and girls and the impact of the system on them or perhaps you know, what their experiences might be and how that might be different uh, from cisgendered women and girls? Yeah, so there's not a lot of good research on that, but it is growing. There's a woman at Irvine, um, Valerie Janess, and she's done a fair bit of work on that. Um, and I would steer you to her work. Um, it's not, uh, for, for trans, both trans women and trans men, it's not a friendly place. Um, and so I think, you know, if that's something you're interested in exposing, it would be great. Um, it's a population with, as we know, a lot of needs. And if the needs of cisgender people are not addressed, I would say the needs of trans people are even less uh, well addressed. Um, my name is Kaylee. I'm with the Fort Worth Star-Telegram, um, and I had a couple of questions. Yeah. Um, so has there been any research that you have done on how the criminalization of sex work impacts the rates of women who are incarcerated? Yeah, um, I, haven't, I haven't looked at those numbers explicitly, um, but we do know that sex work is a huge part of that kind of survival circle, right? So girls who run away from home and are trying to survive um, they get trafficked or they actively choose sex work as a way to survive. Um, it is part of that chronic, chronically system involved high risk dynamic. Um, so yeah, it's huge. Um, and then I also wondered if there was any research that you know of that has looked at, um, especially during COVID, compassionate release or home confinement rates um, comparing men and women. Um, I don't know comparing men and women. What I will say is that a lot of the um, compassionate release during COVID and also efforts to reduce numbers of people in prison more generally by releasing low level offenders, a lot of those have focused on drug offenders. Um, and so that has had a positive impact on the number of women being released. A lot of those programs um, have led to the release of significant numbers of women, oftentimes proportionately more than men. Joseph, with, I'm over here. Hi. <laughs> I'm with the Arizona Republic. Um, we were actually looking at a women's prison in Arizona that uh, the, the DOC claims that their work program that they use is helps with, with rehabilitation. Although it, it is the same kind of work program, it's a, it's a telemarketing program. And of course, they don't really have any kind of proof to back it up. But I'm just kind of curious, you know, from your research, you know, how does rehabilitation, this might go to the last slide that we just don't know, there's not a lot of research, but is there any research to show that certain work programs are better for women than they are for men in certain situations? Or what kind of rehabilitation is actually needed to differentiate between the sexes when it comes to prison? So I would say a couple of things. Um, work programs are super important, right? Um, released offenders need jobs. So the most effective work programs are the ones that train offenders for jobs that they can get on the outside, right? And some do that better than others. Telemarketing, I don't, I don't know the numbers, um, but that seems potentially promising, right? There are jobs in telemarketing um, that, uh, and that's not a kind of licensed profession that they would not be able to access. Um, and so to the extent that those programs then have some kind of wraparound on the outside that actually help people who are trained access jobs in that area, um, that's really the important part, right? And so a lot of times what we see is that there's job training on the inside. There's not a lot of thought to what that training is. It's basically like a time management strategy, like let's give them something to do so they're not getting in trouble while they're here. Um, and there's not a lot of follow-up on the outside to help them actually access jobs that maybe they were trained for 
Um, and so to the extent that um, that kind of, again, that wraparound surface on the outside is, is part of that, I think it has promise, but again, we just, we just have not studied these things very well. The other thing that I will say is that female recidivism, recidivism rates are substantially lower than male recidivism rates. Um, and so, you know, anything that we can do to support them on the outside, knowing that they're probably not going to offend again if we can help them even just a little bit, right? Hi, um, I'm with the Associated Press in Texas. Um, I was wondering how some of this research could um, connect to women who are incarcerated in detention centers, uh, in immigration detention centers, and what kind of research is available regarding um, the issues that they specifically face uh, in these locations and the resources that could be available for them. Yeah, so um, the issue with detention centers is that obviously the women who are incarcerated there are not offenders, right? Um, that said, the significant overlap they have with the populations we're talking about here is trauma and mental health needs, right? Um, both from the experiences that they're bringing with them and from that experience in and of itself. And so I would say um, similar to women and girls who are incarcerated and criminalized, um, that population has significant mental health needs that we need to think about addressing. Hi, I'm Virginia. Hi. I'm a reporter with the Statesman Journal in Salem, Oregon. Thank you for being here. Um, two quick questions for you. Um, the first, can you speak to, I guess, conditions for women in jails and prisons, and then maybe how that compares to conditions for males in prison? Yeah, so um, conditions are poor for everyone. Um, for women and girls, there's a couple of things that are dramatically different than is the case for men and boys. One is that if you, I don't have one, but if I put up a, a map of where the prisons are for women across the country, uh, most states have one, one and maybe up to three if it's a big state. Um, so that means more often than not, when women are incarcerated, they're incarcerated very far away from their families. Um, and it is a huge burden for the families to visit. Um, and so uh, women, the visitation rates for women are substantially lower than is the case for men. Um, and there's an argument to be made that women actually need that visitation and that connection more than men. So that's one thing I would say. Um, the other thing is that we have not prepared well for the mass influx of women into the system. And so if we switch to jails, for instance, those are um, our, our facilities that house both men and women. Um, and the set asides for women are often extremely overcrowded um, and the resources are underwhelming. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, second question is, I was wondering if there was any um, data on the correlation between homelessness and, and justice-involved women and kind of what that would show. Yeah, so that is also part of that survival cycle for the kind of chronic offenders, the ones who get caught up in the system early because of problems at home, running away from home and trying to survive. A lot of them are homeless. So a lot of the women that I've spoken to in jail um, have been homeless on and off um, and get caught up in the system because they're on the streets, they're doing drugs, they get caught up for vagrancy. Remember, we saw that was one of the crimes that was going up for women. That is related to homelessness um, and lack of resources and support, absolutely. Hi, I'm Chandra Bazelko, I'm freelancer. I was wondering if you know of any sources of data of the number of women who are arrested with a romantic partner and have them as co-defendants in the cases um, and a, a follow-up. I haven't been able to find that and if your answer is no, why do you think we're not collecting that data? We probably could study it um, with arrest data. So there's more and more research looking at um, arrest networks. And so if you look at arrest data, you can tell who's arrested um, for the same crime. Uh, and so I have a number of colleagues who are looking at those data on arrest networks. And um, I am actually in conversation with some of them to look at that dynamic, the kind of female and male um, co-defendant dynamic. You can't necessarily tell if they're romantic partners, but you can guess. 
Um, we do know from talking to women, the qualitative data with women in the system, that a significant number of them were arrested with a male partner and got involved in offending through male partners. Um, so it's not a stretch to think the data would bear that out. Um, but you're right, we don't have good data on that. <laughs> Thanks for this. Um, I'm Rio, I am reporting in Las Vegas. Um, something you said at the beginning of your presentation is you haven't seen a lot of coverage on this. Um, my personal experience is it's been difficult to gain access in these spaces, especially because they involve children. Um, so I'm wondering from your research, uh, do you have any suggestions as to maybe some records we could try to request or creative ways to kind of get some of these answers, um, even if it's just trying to get kind of a better idea of what our own um, population looks like in our juvenile justice systems. Um, something I'm particularly interested in is kind of the certification process from and, and who is more likely um, to be certified as an adult and charged as an adult, but I've hit a lot of roadblocks. Trying to yeah, so I answer. would say um, a couple of potentially friendly populations to um, talk to are social support services on the outside um, and kind of befriending them because they know a lot. Um, and they know a lot about the um, problems that their uh, clients navigate um, and they tend to have access to numbers. Um, and so that's, that's a good place to start. And then I think the hardest place to start is actually in the system. Um, they're, it's hard. It took me years to get into the jails um, and it took like going up the chain to county managers and just like being persistent. Um, and I know, you know, you know, I, I work on other projects and I can, I can waste years on that and just like wait till it happens. But I know in journalism, you want things to happen more quickly. And I think working from outside to get in is probably a quicker way than working from inside to get anything, sadly. So this is sort of piggybacking off the question about male co-defendants. Um, but I was wondering if there's any research specifically on whether women are more likely to be convicted as accomplices um, for like serious violent offenses. And um, if not, could you just speak generally about like how women end up there and whether there's like coercion involved or if they're um, reacting against a, an abuser? Um, yeah, things. so um, violence for women looks very different than violence for men. The vast majority of women arrested for violence are arrested for crimes, um, violence against people that they know and are close to. Um, so intimate partners, children, family members, close friends, partners, those kinds of things. Um, that is also the case for men, but um, it, we're talking probably 60 to 70 percent of women and maybe 20 to 40 percent of male violence is of that character. Um, so when women get incarcerated for violence, um, it's often in the context of family and relationship violence of some sort or another, and it's um, often not clear whether that violence played out as mutual self-defense, um, you know, female inflicted, those dynamics are really murky um, and self-defense claims are complicated. Um, so I just don't know those numbers. Um, I do know, like I said, that in the stories of women in the system, um, male partners play a uh, pretty substantial role in their stories of how they got there. Um, but in terms of actual numbers, I wish I could speak to that, but I really can't with confidence. Hi. Hi. I'm Craig McCarthy from the New York Post. Um, so you had had a slide up before about the rates of arrest of women compared to men during um, our mass incarceration. So it's kind of in two parts of do you think this has anything to do in that time, or is there any data to show that it had to do with a very, obviously, law enforcement is very male-dominated, and that kind of led to <clears throat> wrapping up women into these charges? And on the second part of that, and especially with Say that again, the second part of, of, of part. wrapping people up into charges, like because it's a male-dominated field, that is, you know, is there any data to show out, uh, that plays out that in maybe places that had a more diverse police 
force or anything like that led to less, uh, fewer incarcerated women. And on top of that, I, I think I'm thinking of an example in New Jersey, the Eda Man um, prison, where the DOC is obviously not diverse either, and they led to a numerous amount of sexual assault and covering that up. And if there's any to, data to show that, having more female corrections officers or even just employees work there would help address some of those mental health issues and other things, at least having that um, understanding. Yeah, so um, those are complicated questions because those systems, while there are more females in those positions than has been the case in the past, these are still significantly male-dominated professions, um, both uh, policing and corrections. And so there is some evidence to suggest that women do better in correctional settings where there are female COs. Um, but even more, what the data suggests is that women do better when the COs are trained in trauma-informed practices. Um, and so, you know, it's, it's, I would say it's less about gender and more about sensitivity to the needs of the women in those settings. Um, and so if we're not going to train in kind of trauma-informed, um, you know, kind of interactions, then probably women are maybe arguably more intuitive at that, and that's why um, there's some evidence that women do better when under the direction of female COs, but I think, again, the better evidence is that the COs understand the trauma histories that these women bring with them. I don't know about the first question about changes in arrests um, across jurisdiction depending on the gender distribution of the police force. I think that's an interesting question. Yeah, it's more like you know, how the police force represents the community. Yeah, it's complicated. That. There's a lot more research looking at that, looking at the racial um, distribution of police forces and whether and how that changes the racial dynamics of arrest. Um, and the answer is murky, like yes and no, and depending on X, Y, and Z. Um, and I suspect the same would be for gender. Hi, I'm Sanjana, I'm with HuffPost. Um, I just wanted to see if you had any data on pregnant mothers or pregnant women um, in the carceral system, and um, I don't know if there's any, any data on whether they come, they're able to give birth, um, if there's a miscarriage rate, uh, I guess what the healthcare looks like in them for um, specifically pregnant Yeah, women. so I actually just lectured on that in my class last week. Um, so it's pretty fresh for me. Uh, and, I, and I will say two things. One, the data are abysmal. Um, if you're really interested in this, there's a woman named um, Sufrin is her last name, and I'm blanking on her first name. It's S-U-F-R-I-N. She does wonderful work on this. This is like what she's interested in. Um, she's got a really good TED talk about the physical health needs of women in the system. Um, and Carol, I think her name is, or Carolyn. Um, and the one thing that is really problematic around pregnancy is um, pregnancy treatment. Um, so there's very little in-house um, medical services for pregnant women. They're often transferred out of the facility um, for pregnancy needs and for birth. What that means when they're transferred out of the facility is that they're shackled oftentimes. Um, and pregnancy and shackling do not go well together. And so there are laws around the country um, to make it illegal um, for incarcerated women to be shackled during birth, childbirth. Um, but those laws, more often than not, don't extend to pregnancy more broadly. Um, and so there are all kinds of interesting um, and, and important efforts around the country to deal with pregnant incarcerated women and shackling and health needs and treatment and those kinds of things. Um, so yeah, good question. <laughs>